All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Well, good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. We're going to start with the roll call, please. Madam Clerk. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman. Supervisor Sellers. Present. Supervisor Galvin. Here. Supervisor Hickman. Here. Supervisor Gallardo. Here. Chairman Gates. Here. Um, Chairman, just so you know, um, Andrea Cummings, your OML attorney, is on the line. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, we're, we're looking forward to an opportunity to hear about the election plans um, for 2022, all the hard work of the recorder and, and the elections department. Um, but I wanted to start off today, um, Maricopa, County, Maricopa County is mourning uh, this morning. Um, over the weekend, uh, we lost our former county attorney, Alistair Adele. Uh, a friend to, to all of us uh, and a, an incredible leader in our community. And so I'd like to start off with a moment of silence and then I'll give my colleagues an opportunity to make any comments that they would like. So with that, if we could all please stand for a moment of silence for Alistair Adele. Thank you. Please be seated. And at this time, I would invite my colleagues if they'd like to make any comments. Supervisor Gallardo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for uh, having a, a moment of silence for Alistair. Um, I didn't know Alistair uh, prior to the interviews and, and when we were making this election uh, to uh, to uh, our new county attorney at the time and uh, got to know her uh, really fast. Uh, everyone I spoke with um, outside the county at that time spoke very highly of her. They knew her for a long time, folks from the Capitol, folks from the legal community, just from all over, just really spoke highly of her. And um, the decision was simple. And, and we selected Alistair to be the next uh, county attorney at that time. Um, I know it has not been um, a, a simple path for her at that time. Um, there was uh, personal issues she uh, had to deal with and I, I fully understand. Um, but you cannot ever anticipate um, something like this happening. She was a friend, a colleague. Um, I met with her just, I think it was the middle of August, or not, middle of March, um, in her office. I, she wanted to talk. Um, everything was kind of buzzing at the time, and, and uh, she asked, uh, I'll come to you. I said, no, 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 I'll come to you. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go to your office, and walked over there and had a nice conversation with her, private conversation. I wished her well, and uh, it's just unfortunate. It's just a sad, sad time for Maricopa County. My prayers and, and thoughts go to the family, particularly the kids. I know she loved the kids as, as much as we all uh, love the young, the young ones. Um, she always brought up the, the uh, kids. She's always had, had the kids in her discussions with me. Um, so it's just a sad, sad time. And um, I just wish the family uh, my thoughts and prayers, and uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy time. And, um, you know, you lose your mom, especially for the kids. You, I mean, your mom's your everything. And uh, my thoughts and wishes are my, my thoughts and prayers to the family and the kids. Thank you, Supervisor Gallardo. Supervisor Sellers. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and again, I, I agree with what Steve said. I'll, I'll be very brief, but, you know, this, this really has been devastating for us because it feels like losing a family member. Uh, I feel like the most important thing that we can do at this point is to give her family space and privacy. Uh, and again, my, my thoughts and prayers are with them. 
Thank you, Supervisor Sellers. Super, Supervisor Galvin. Mr. Chairman, thank you. This is definitely a sad day for the county, um, for people who work here, and obviously people who knew her and cared about her. Um, I just met with her just a couple of months ago, and we had a very good meeting, also in her office as well. We walked over there, and she was very gracious and very proud of the work that she was doing and the job that she had um, and the building that she was in. She gave me a wonderful tour of the building, and we had a really good meeting and talked about all the things that we look forward to working on together. Um, but you know, since in light of the recent events, all I wanted more than anything was for her to, to have good health. Um, but I just feel really bad for her and her family and, and the friends who treasure her. But I want Alistair Adele to be remembered as a trailblazer. She was the first female appointed county attorney and the first female elected county attorney. Um, that will always be in the history books for her. But as well, I just want her to be remembered for her dedication to public service because she clearly loved her job and she clearly loved serving the people of Maricopa County. Thank you. Thank you, Super, Supervisor Galvin. Vice Chair Hickman. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for giving us all the opportunity. Um, you know, I was, I was sitting with my uh, wife and daughter when I got the news on Saturday morning, and it's just a uh, shock. And I think the whole community is, is shocked about it. So the one thing I'd like to, what I'd like to say is um, I had a very nice discussion. I, I think everyone knew that I was uh, friends with her dad before I even met uh, Alistair um, through Rotary. And I had a nice conversation with him. Um, and he had told me that uh, the probably the services are going to move relatively quick, as quick as they can. Uh, I checked in on his, uh, you know, his grandsons and uh, his son-in-law. And he just wanted uh, everyone to know that how much the, he appreciates um, the outpouring of support for his daughter. And uh, that I truly hope that we do offer them space uh, to grieve. And uh, as Supervisor Gallardo said, yeah, a, a mother is a special thing in every family. And those two little boys are now going to be missing their mother, but hopefully this community can wrap their arms around those boys uh, and offer them the space that they so deserve. Thank you, Vice Chair Hickman. Thanks for reaching out to, to Alistair's father and, and, and thanks for letting us know about that. It is a, a terribly sad day for us. But I think, you know, what, what I'm trying to think about is, is the good times, to think about Alistair, how much happiness she brought. She, was, she had an infectious personality. Um, and she loved this opportunity. She was so grateful for this opportunity and to have played a small part in that, I'm really proud of that. Um, she, she always said this was her dream job to be county attorney and she put everything she had into it. She is a trailblazer. She uh, will always be remembered by history, um, but I'll remember her as a friend as someone, no matter what was going on, when we had a conversation at the end, she would always say, how can I help you? And that was her. She was always, you know, worried about others and wanting to help them and wanting to improve their lives. And that's what she brought to her public service, both as a, in the county attorney's office, as the county attorney, uh, with the Maricopa County Bar Association, she has a great legacy for all of us who got to know her, who considered her a friend, will never forget her. And I definitely send uh, my family's thoughts and prayers to her family. It is tragic um, for the boys to be left without a mother, but we're, we're all here for that family. Whatever they need, we will give them the space they need, but we're here for them. The county family is here for them in the future. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for your support uh, of their family and, uh, and thank you for giving us a few minutes to speak about our thoughts about our friend and our colleague. We love you, Alistair.
All right, so uh, today uh, is an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, um, to uh, hear about the election plan and all the incredible work that has been done, again, by the recorder's office in the election department of Maricopa County. Um, so at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome up our recorder, Stephen Richer, and our co-directors of elections. Feels like you guys were just up here. <laughs> Mr. Jarrett. Mr. Valenzuela, good morning. Mr. Richer. All right. All right. It, I'm sorry, before we get started, my apologies. I want to acknowledge uh, our assessor who's here today, Eddie Cook. Great to see you. Uh, appreciate the support. And um, so good to see you, Mr. Richer. No, it's, it's fitting that you should talk about Eddie because Eddie has been a consistent friend and ally of the Maricopa County Recorder's Office and Elections Department. And really to what we were just talking about, Maricopa County is more than just a, a, a county of individually elected officers. We are friends here. We are a family here. And we are working together towards a, a shared goal that really every single elected official believes in at this county and that's serving this county well and that's bettering the lives of individual Maricopa County residents. Eddie embodies that, Alistair embodied that. Alistair was a friend before she even applied to be county attorney. She was a friend while running to be elected as county attorney and she was a friend while she was county attorney serving both my office and Maricopa County at large. Alistair, like Bill said, always ended my phone conversations with how can I help you? And so I'll let her help me one more time. And that's by impressing upon us the humanity of everything that we do and that though we might get caught up in things that seem extraordinary to us at the time, things that seem the most important things in the political landscape, whether it's water, whether it's transportation, or whether it's elections, all of that pales compared to our, our, our existence as a human being. And so thank you, Alistair, for reminding of us of that. Thank you for always being willing to help and thank you for helping one more time and thank you for reminding us that first and foremost, we're all humans just, just trying to live a good life. So, all right. With that, we will turn to the 2022 elections plan for both the August 2nd primary election and the November general election. And I'm gonna let the real experts do the talking, but I just wanna take a second to impress upon any of the viewing public, and I'll certainly uh, avail myself of future opportunities to, to let everyone know that this is not just an operation that's hiding behind a curtain and then you know, kazam, uh, election happens. Um, this is something that is thought about for many months. This is something that is documented. This is something that is very public. And this is something that we welcome the public to follow along at all stages of the process. In this 60 plus page document, you can find out everything from the cost of the election to exactly how many poll workers need to be hired to what needs to happen on certain days, uh, as we say in the election world, from E minus 27 to E minus 13 to whatever day it is. And so really, if you are interested in elections and if you have input on elections and if you want to be part of the elections conversation and that conversation moving into, I hope, 2022, then I would encourage you to start with this document because this is the document by which we will conduct our affairs over the next few months. And this is the document that we solicit feedback on and that you can follow along with. And, you know, this is the document to which you can hold us accountable after approved by the board. Um, and this is the document that we believe will guide an election that is accessible, that is fair, that is secure, and that is transparent, and that makes Maricopa County proud. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Jared, are you going to kick us off? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board recorder. We thank you for the opportunity this morning on the somber day to be able to present the 2022 election plan to the Maricopa County Board for your consideration. 
This plan covers the methodologies and strategies that the Elections Department will implement to administer successful elections in 2022. It goes into detail about how we'll communicate with voters, how they can successfully participate in the election. It'll go into detail on how we'll recruit and train all of our poll workers. It goes into detail of how we'll process all those early ballots. It goes into detail of how we'll set up and support our voting locations. It talks through how we'll tabulate all of those ballots that will come into the Elections Department. And it also talks about what our contingency plans are. If our plan A doesn't go according to plan, and we have to respond accordingly and keep our elections moving forward. So with that, I'll go ahead and move to some information that voters need to know. And these plans are very detailed and, and cover an extensive amount of detail that voters do need to know. Now, we won't have time today to go through all of that. So I do encourage voters to go to um, the Elections Department's website and download a copy of this plan. Now, we'll be highlighting some key questions as we go through this, this plan. Some of those questions are outlined here on this first slide. And those include what contests are on the ballot. And this is actually one of the most important questions. It's the initial question that voters ask themselves if they're going to participate in the election. And this being a gubernatorial election cycle, the even year between the presidential cycles, um, we'll have all the statewide contests on the ballot. This will include governor, it'll include the secretary of state, it'll include the attorney general's office. There will be a few countywide contests on the ballot. It will be the county attorney's office, it'll be board of supervisor district two on the ballot. It'll also include some federal contests. We'll have the U.S. Senate. In Arizona, we have nine congressional di districts Eight of those congressional districts overlap Maricopa County. So there'll be eight um, U.S. Um, House members on the ballot as well. There will be all of our state legislature, state, le state legislators um, from all the different legislative districts. Um, in Maricopa County, that's over 22, or right at 22 different legislative districts. There will also be, in the August primary, 23 local jurisdictions on the ballot in the November general election that could be upwards of 100 different jurisdictions on the ballot. We also ask who can vote. So in just like any state in this country, you have to be a um, U.S. citizen to vote. You also need to be a resident of Maricopa County, and you need to be 18 by, the t by the election day. So if that's the August primary, August 2nd, if it's the November general election, November 8th. You also need to be registered to vote. So that's who will be able to vote in these upcoming elections. One, uh, there's a lot of confusion around whether independents can participate and vote in the August primary election. So, and yes, they can. And in Maricopa, or in Arizona and Maricopa County, it is an open primary election. That means that independents can uh, vote a Republican ballot a Democratic ballot or a nonpartisan ballot. So that'd be if they, if the local jurisdiction, the city or town in which they live is having a contest, they can select just to get those contests on their ballot. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Sellers. Yeah, just for clarity though, they, they have to select a ballot. It's not one ballot that would be in effect if you truly had an open primary. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Sellers, that's exactly correct. So the one difference for independent voters or a voter that doesn't, hasn't declared their party is they won't be automatically sent a ballot. So those voters that are on the active early voting list, they have to take one additional step. And this actually happens to be the week that we're sending out our 90-day cards. Mr. Valenzuela will be going into detail on exactly what those cards are. Um, but they give the, those independent voters the opportunity to tell us what ballot they want for us to, us to send them. Now, if they're an in-person voter, they just show up to the polls on either that in-person early voting period or on election day. And at that point in time, they tell us what ballot they want. We have ballot on demand technology in all of our voting locations. We'll be able to print their specific ballot and then they'll be able to vote that ballot. Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Vice Chair Hickman. So I remember a long time ago, uh, we had a lot of independents show up in a primary election. 
um, I think it was a presidential preference election, so um, that we're told they couldn't uh, vote. So this primary, people can show up because of the technologies that we've offered. Is that is that why um, have there been new statutory issues that have occurred that uh, they can vote in the in this primary? Looks like Mr. Richard wants to answer that. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just uh, <laughs> I Supervisor just, Hickman's <laughs> trying to stir the pot and keep, get people confused. But no, that, there's an important distinction. We, we've <laughs> learned lessons <laughs> here, here for many years. And there, there, there's an important distinction that you made and, and that we take a second nature in the elections system here in Maricopa County, but that everyone has to relearn every two years, unfortunately, and that's the presidential preference election, which happens every presidential cycle and happens in March, is different from the Arizona primary. And so in an Arizona primary, independents can participate. You just have to take that extra step of picking your party. But uh, for a presidential preference election, you have to be a registered member of that party. And so yes, in 2016, there were a lot of independents who were excited to vote for, I, I guess at that point it was either maybe Bernie Sanders or Joe uh, or Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or who else was it? Kasich, I think, at that point. And unfortunately, they couldn't show up, and so we had a lot of lines. So, But for this one, for this August, let's focus on that. You can participate. Thank you, Rico. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to note the record, Mr. Chairman, this has been an issue going back since day one. I remember even in 2003, my first years in the legislature being the House, having this discussion at the legislature, and unfortunately, it still has not been resolved or fixed by the legislature, but it should be a priority. You are confusing the hell out of these voters. And as much as the legislature, particularly the Senate, think they're geniuses when it comes to elections, <laughs> this is a perfect example. If they want to do something right, if they want to really help us conduct elections and help voters, this is an issue in which they should address immediately. Mr. Chairman, Thank I take you. exception to yes. one thing that Mr. Richard said. No one was excited to vote for Kasich. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mr. Jarrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the explanation, recorder. So th the next question that um, some of our members of our community may be asking is how will they help and how will they get involved? And we'll go through this as part of the presentation, but we will be recruiting over 3,300 temporary workers to support us through this election. Some of those will be working several months. Some of those might only be working on election day but we really are dependent on those community members to come out to support us and to visit our website at getinvolved.maricopa.vote um, to help support the election. We also, um, voters might be asking how can they vote or how can they participate in this election? All the, our plans also cover this. Um, the Elections Department provides three distinct voting models, whether that's voting by mail, dropping off the early ballot at any one of our voting locations or voting in person during early voting, emergency voting, or election day. We'll provide further details in this presentation. And then also, when do I need to be registered? And that brings us actually to a important slide, and that's the key election dates for the upcoming elections. So here we have um, two different columns. Uh, the column on the top sort of outlines all those key dates that occur for the August primary. Um, the bottom column outlines all those key dates for the November 8th general election. So we've not highlighted actually, in our minds, the election actually started on March 5th when that was the candidate filing period. And that period has now passed. We're now just wrapping up the candidate challenge period. There's a few cases that are before or being appealed to theirs on a Supreme Court. Once those are resolved, that's when the Elections Department will go into proofing and really designing all of those ballots. For an August primary, that could be upwards of 15,000 different ballot styles. It'll take us several weeks to get through all that, that proofing to make sure every one of those is accurate. So that's the period we're in now. And then we will have that first mailing of ballots. Those are for our overseas and military voters. We refer to them as UOCAVA voters, the Uniform Overseas Absentee Voting Act. So that'll happen on June 8th for the August primary. Then we'll have the July 5th voter registration date. And I wanted to point out a couple items here related to both of the vo voter registration deadlines. They 
actually happen to fall on holidays this year. So the voter registration deadline falls on July 4th. That, so usually that's 29 days before the election. So this year it moves to the day after as outlined in state statute. And so it will fall on E28 or 28 days before the election. And that's the same thing with the voter registration deadline for on October 11th for the November 8th general election and that falls on Columbus Day, so it will move then to that Tuesday, be on October 11th, be 28 days before the general election. We also wanna highlight then that on July 6th and then October 12th, those are the first days of early voting, and that's when we will be mailing out all of our uh, early ballots to anyone who signed up on the active early voting list for July 6th, as we've discussed um, on our prior slides, if you're on the active early voting list and you are an independent voter, you will not be getting that ballot mailed automatically unless you've taken action through those 90-day cards or gone to our website request.maricopa.vote and then we can um, send them that ballot that they do request. I want to highlight also the last day to mail back that early ballot. We have moved this up into the election cycle. This is consistent with 2020. It's based on advice and guidance from the U.S. Post Office. It used to be uh, six days before the election. Now it's seven days before the election that we want them to return or send that mail, that early ballot back to us in the mail. However, if they don't, they can still take that ballot to any one of our early voting locations or drop it off on election day. Now we prefer to get it back before election day so we can pro start processing that. It takes us just as any of those early ballots several days to go through um, signature verification, early ballot processing, then tabulation. So we'd prefer they don't wait to election day, but voters in Arizona are afforded that opportunity or that option. And then the final days that I want to highlight is just August 2nd. That is election day for the August primary, the November 8th, the election day for the November general election. Supervisor Galvin. Just a quick question. So if for the primary, if you mail your ballot, let's say in July 31 and do everything correct, will your vote, vote be counted eventually? So Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, so if they mail it back on July 31 and the post office delivers it to us by 7 p.m. on election night, it will be counted. Um, if it is delivered to us after that 7 p.m. deadline, then it will not be counted. And then we do keep stats. Ray, Mr. Valenzuela knows many of those stats about 2020, how many ballots were received after the election. But and that 7 p.m. deadline was set when? Uh, so is Mr. Chairman, deal? Supervisor Galvin, that is set in state statute. Mr. Valenzuela, do you know when that was finalized? or that's when that a, law passed. Sorry, I'll rephrase. That's not a new statute, is it? Correct. It's Correct, but there are some there are some states where it is a postmark date, but in Arizona it is still a receipt day, right. state. Right. So it has to be received by our office by 7 p.m. on election day, right. and that has been that way for as long as any of us exactly. can so remember. Exactly, so this is yeah. not new. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's correct. And one other um, point here is we actually send a bipartisan team to the post office. So we're on site at 7 p.m. on election night. So any ballots that are at the post office at 7 p.m. that are within their custody can be transferred to us. And then we take possession of them and then start that early ballot processing. Are those just best practices that you found uh, to work out well for the voter? Is there usually a lot of ballots sitting there at that time? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, we've actually done a really great job of informing voters of that, that re last request date. So over the years, that number has been decreasing um, because of our robust paid and earned media strategy. Okay. So I don't recall what that number was in 2020. Do you know, Ray? Yeah, in 2020, I mean, we call them late, the late pickup. Uh, that 7 p.m. pickup at the post office yielded about 2,000 plus ballots. So although, you know, out of 1.9 million, it's still a substantial amount. But on that given day, we may have picked up 100,000 at the 10 a.m. pickup. So it's, it is a pretty good clean or sweep the floors, if you will, to only have 2,000. But it's a decent amount that we are, and it is a best practice that we've established. 
Right. We better not see your ballot in that last pickup. <laughs> I like to test our systems. <laughs> You'll be standing at the polls. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, these plans go through and document how the Elections Department is providing accessible, reliable, transparent, secure, and efficient efficient election processes. And the Elections Department has also adopted a philosophy of continuous improvement, meaning that we're always trying to be as agile, as flex flexible, nimble as possible as we go through the election process. And this is not only just a best practice, but it's a necessity in Maricopa County, the second largest voting jurisdiction in the country. We're serving over 2.6 million voters. We're also larger than geographically larger than seven states. So that means we have to be efficient as we're serving these voters. And we're doing that while providing, as I discussed previously, three different distinct models. That's a voter can uh, participate and return a ballot by mail. So that's dropping it off at the post office that will come to us and then we'll process that ballot. They can also take that early ballot, whether it was automatically sent to them because they're on the active early voting list, whether they made a one-time request through our website um, to request that or through the 90-day postcard, um, and then they drop that ballot off at any one of our early our in-person voting locations or our secure drop boxes, or if they choose to vote in person. Now, when Ray and I talk about these distinct voting models, our staff really remind us that there's many other options that we are also offering, and these are all offered through federal and state laws, and these are to serve those other voters. So we do have uh, opportunities for if there are voters in a unique circumstance, such as a military or overseas voters, those UOCAVA voters. They can return that ballot to us through a secure portal. They can also return that ballot to us via fax. We also um, offer special election boards. So if a voter needs assistance in completing that ballot, maybe they're in a nursing home or they've lost the ability to use their arms and they need that assistance, we send out bipartisan special election boards to help serve those voters. We also offer in-person in -person options for a voter that may have a disability. So if that voter wants to vote in person, but they don't want to go into an actual voting location, they can use our curbside voting options. We also inspect every one of our voting locations to make sure that it's ADA compliant. Um, and we offer a ADA accessible um, voting device in all of our different voting locations. So while there's three distinct models, there are these other models that we're offering to ensure that every voter can participate in the elections process if they choose and how they choose. Yeah, I'm just, if I may, uh, as the new guy to this side of the, of, of the presentation at least, just we've been talking a lot about security in elections over the last year and a half, but I, upon taking this office, have just been incredibly impressed with the bend over backward mentality that Maricopa County Elections Department has to serve all voters. Um, and, and just really, you think of voting as either vote by mail or vote in person, but there's just a multitude of ways, and it will continue to be our philosophy that we will do, we will move mountains if you are a valid voter and you want to participate and there is something that is standing in the way, we will move mountains to make sure that you are able to vote. And that, that, that was something that was already in place when I stepped into this office and that's something that is certainly being carried out at hopefully even a, a higher level now and that I've been consistently impressed with. And Mr. Richer, thank you for saying that. I, I think I can speak on behalf of my colleagues that we feel the same way that that's very important that we've got constituents who love voting on election day. We wanna protect their right to do that, but we also have a lot of constituents who enjoy the convenience or, of either voting in person early or voting by mail. And I think uh, we, you know, it's very 2022, right? Get it, whatever, Burger King, you know, have it your way. Um, that's how we do it here. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of voting jurisdictions just aren't that way. Yeah, and to the point about voting by mail, um, Scott may actually touch on this, but actually our percentage of voters who are on the active early voting list has gone up 2% since the 2020 election to where 75% were on the active early voting list and now 77% are on the active early voting list. Vice Chair Hickman. You know how you just said, uh, and I like to test systems. Well, today, 
as I walked into the building and asked Ray, hey, looking forward to seeing the presentation. And he said, we, how, how busy have you guys been? Very busy, and he started clunking off everything that's going on today, and I said, and you, didn't, and you left off an important election that's going on right now, the Litchfield Park election. So I tested the system today by going to the early ballot secure drop box offered up by Litchfield Park, and I walked in, and there was the clerk watching me drop off, and she even said hi. So h hello to you guys, um, because I wanted to just find out if there was a possible way that I could get through and drop off my without being seen, and she there she was, you know, right there watching it. So. Again, um, I know how much thought that has gone into all of these things over the many years, actually, and to, for best practices, and um, I was very happy to see that. I said hello to her also. So uh, you'll be getting my ballot at some point uh, in the, the afternoon, I think, Ray. So. Vice Chair Hickman always working for his constituents. Yeah. <laughs> Just testing. You bet. That's good Mr. Stuff. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, and not only did was that clerk there to monitor that that early ballot drop box, but that early ballot drop box is locked. It's sealed mm -hmm. with tamper evidence seals. There are serial numbers on those seals, and then that, your ballot, along with any others that were dropped off at that voting location, then will be transported from that location by a bipartisan team of couriers that will bring those early ballots back, still sealed in those early ballot affidavit envelopes. They'll go through an audit here at the elections department before then we process them and then continue them through that processing. So a very secure process that voters should be rest assured that it's safe and their ballot, if they drop it at an early ballot drop box, will be received by the elections department. Mm -hmm. So the recorder sort of <laughs> was providing a precursor to something that we're doing as we do this for every large scale election is we attempt to forecast turnout and identify how many voters may participate in the election, whether that is uh, in total through the early ballot process, early in person or on election day. And we use a, a variety of different indica indicators. Some of those are established by state law and the Secretary of State's Elections Procedures Manual. So that's one foreca forecast model we use. We also use other forecast models that will try to look at historical voting patterns going all the way, in this case, going back all the way to 1946, all the way through 2020, and how many voters tr typically participate during a gubernatorial election process. We also look at recent and current events, how many voters have participated in recent presidential election years, and how, how many typically are that decrease between a presidential year and a gubernatorial election cycle. So we're taking all of these data inputs to try to identify how many resources we will need to support the elections process. And we do this for a variety of reasons. First off, elections are infrequent, and it's difficult to forecast turnout. Um, and a lot of what drives turnout is what is on the ballot. Is that very first question that I mentioned in this presentation. Is it a very controversial ballot measure, a very popular, unpopular candidate? Those types of things will drive turnout, and those are election-specific situations. So the way we overcome that is by providing a variety of different inputs into our election models. And so what we've done, and one of those indicators is how many voters are signed up on that active early voting list? Is that increasing? How has that pattern or trend been trending through the last several different election cycles? So we've gone through and we've inputted all of these different pieces of information, data elements into these models, ran through different simulations. And right now we're projecting that 83 to 90 percent of voters will turn out early, and that may be by mail or to vote in person early. So in the August uh, election, that could be anywhere from 643 to 813,000 voters will be participating early. In November, that could be anywhere from 1.2 to 1.5 million voters participating early during the election. So then we're also then focused on, well, how many voters may vote 
in person on election day. So for the August uh, primary election, we're, we're anticipating anywhere from 108 to 180,000 uh, voters may participate uh, on election day. And for the November general election, we'll have 150 to 321,000. Now these are wide ranges, and the reason why they're wide ranges is because we have all those different data elements going into the to these election models. However, when we're planning for this, we focus on the higher numbers. We want to make sure that we had sufficient re resources to make sure that we can serve these voters. For, so for the total turnout for August uh, primary election, it could be anywhere from 748 to 961 voters. That's a 26 or 28 to 36 percent turnout. And then the November general election, anywhere from 1.4 to 1.9 million, that's anywhere from a 55 to 69 percent turnout for these upcoming election cycles. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Valenzuela to go through some components of the mail-in voting plan. Chairman Gates, members of the board, um, we're going to speak to early voting. I'm going to let Scott go ahead and run the slides because this is the one time I have an opportunity to tell him what to do, and most <laughs> of the time I don't, so I'll take advantage of that. Uh, but early voting, obviously, as, as uh, Mr. Jared indicated, is, is an important part of, it always has been. The general 2020, 91% of the ballots cast were early. Obviously, with the ebb and flow of a gubernatorial versus presidential, we still anticipate as the turnout, you know, 83 to 90 percent. So it's going to be a substantial part of the election. So the early voting is a critical part. And one of the things we want to do is, on top of allowing to increase access to mail or to the to the process, is tell or let voters know what they need to know about early voting. There's a lot to you know pack and to unpack if we were gonna do this here, so we're hoping voters will go to our website, maricopa.vote, and look at some of these infographics that will show a little bit uh, presentation. But the key things to know is that one of the, the main things that I think is that we promote is the ability for you to know what's happening with your ballot. As an example, dropping off your ballot, if you're in, if you join the tech service, we like to consider, and not to plug any particular company, the Amazon of elections is what we consider ourselves as. You, I mean, if you're uh, out there, you want to know where your packet's at, you should want to know where your ballot's at. So if you opt to and exercise that right, we have the text uh, ballot status process where you would just simply text the word join to 628683 for the public. If you're on the ABLE, and even if you're not, actually you'll be able to get a status if you opt to do a one-time mail ballot. So joining that will allow you to, when you drop it off, when we get it and we have those ballot couriers go pick those up, we'll get it in in-house, we'll scan it in. When we scan it in, Supervisor Hickman, you'll get that text if you're in that that says we have received your ballot. It's undergoing signature verification. All the way to the point of it has been accepted in signature verification or we have a questionable signature. You know, some chicken signed this ballot. It's not just had to plug that. But Sorry. Chickens out of this. <laughs> exactly. But it, but it gives you that benefit to be able to know the exact moment we receive it, the moment that has been set as good and to be counted. And that's something that we want to emphasize to the voter, that the transparency is important to us. This is one of the main things that if we can get people to sign up, and I think we're upwards of 200,000. But when I say that, we have 1.9 million voters on ABLE. So that we need those other 1,600,000 people to join that and to be able to track that ballot for good of the process. Uh, the other thing is, of course, we uh, emphasize what the voters need to know is when to request, the deadline to request, and those key dates point those out that in the slides ahead and also in the plan itself, where E minus 11, which is 11 days before, prior to the election, you're going to, that's the last day to request a ballot if you're not unable. Uh, so we want to make sure everybody's aware of that 11-day deadline for both primary and general. Look at that key date. Look at our website to find that date. Uh, it's important because some folks, maybe you're not a all time or always permanent voter by mail, but it is a process by which you may not realize you need that because you're going out of town. So know that date, know that you can add a temporary address. All of that information can be found through the, our website, but it is a key thing to remember. And again, the date to mail it back. That's the most important thing. Some of the numbers that throw out there, as Scott had indicated, we are doing a really good job 
Um, so much so that people believe it's just maybe too good of a job, but we are contacting the voters. We're using this technology and we're assisting voters with curing their ballots, if you will. It's a statutory allowance that says you missed a questionable signature. Uh, we contact you. We send you a letter. We send you by email. We send a phone call. If you're on that, that process to get a ballot set us by text, you'll get that. But we are very adamant about getting those contacted, but we need the help of the voter to get them to us in time. And Mr. Valenzuela, can you just address that for a moment? Uh, would you say you've gotten better at that over time? Chairman Gates, members of the board, I would say absolutely. Not only do we get better, it, but statute has grown with it. So there was a statutory change in 2016 that allowed us for, or after 2016 election, that allowed us to cure ballot. Basically, you returned your ballot. It's to some degree we're questioning the signature because yes, your signature has matured. We know that, and we may only have one signature. For the most part, we have multiple signatures, and we don't have. We can use those as reference. But for that voter that happens to register new here, and we have one signature and it's from when you were 18 years old and you're now 22 and you're a doctor and your signature is totally different, whatever the case may be, uh, it is we want to be able to assist you. And so we've done a better job because that law allows us to go up to seven days after election, five business days, which equates to seven days of contacting you. And we're required to. And we have gone to the almost to the point of a, a, taking that to the next level where we've brought in 40 plus individuals right after election to make sure we're expediting that contact, reach out to the voters. So yeah, we went from a couple of thousand that we could not, because at 7 p.m. deadline used to be, that's it. We could not cure, now we can. So we've gone from a couple of thousand that were bad signatures, if you will, that down to 507 out of the 1.9. But we did contact 20,000 plus voters. Yeah. So that's the key uh, thing to know. I want to emphasize that point because I had nothing to do with it, so I can brag about it on behalf of Maricopa County. But in 20, November 2020 election, Maricopa County cured over 24,000 ballot on, affidavit envelopes. And so what that represents is somebody whose signature was deemed inaccurate for whatever reason originally. But then we reached out to that person or that person proactively reached out to us because of this text message system or because of beballotready.vote. And we said, hey, your signature doesn't look like the signatures that we have on file. Was this really you? And so if that person says yes, after offering personally identifying information, then that is a vote that would have been effectively put in the garbage can. Not, not really, but effectively. And yet Maricopa County in 2020 saved 24,000 of those. And so really, I think that's something, again, I had nothing to do with it, but that should be celebrated because that's 24,000 individuals that Maricopa County empowered as voters in 2020. And Mr. Chairman, one other improvement that we've uh, implemented in the past in 2020 and will carry forward to the 2022 elections is we hired additional curing staff. So a team of 40 individuals that could work in the evening periods when voters were actually home, making that outbound call. So that really helps with that curing process. Also, they're working over the weekend. So Mr. Valenzuela mentioned five business days, seven calendar days. That allows for that curing activity to occur on both Saturday and Sunday. Also, making those outbound calls when voters are actually home, helping that curing process. Well, that, that's great, uh, great work, and it sounds like something we should be congratulated for, not criticized for, but unfortunately, some elected officials are criticizing the county for doing good customer service, which I don't understand. Vice Chair Hickman. Um, I seem to remember uh, something looked at, I think, uh, by an independent source called a judge. Wasn't there some sort of lawsuit uh, where we looked at these processes? Um, can you tell me what that lawsuit was and what, what they found out? Because truly in front of a judge, yeah. an, impartial, um, an impartial arbiter of government, um, do you, do you remember that? So Supervisor Hickman, I'm, I'm an empiricist. And so when people started asking questions about the signature verification process, I wanted actual numbers. 
there's a limited number of, of studies on this, but I'm aware of two in the post-2020 election context. One was regarding our very own Maricopa County, and that was in the litigation Ward versus Jackson, in which both plaintiffs' forensic experts and defendants' forensic experts looked at a sample of signatures, and they concluded that there was no evidence of fraud or forgery in any of those samples. That decision was unanimously affirmed by the Arizona Supreme court who said that there was no evidence or fraud or maladministration or significant error in the administration of the 2020 election. The other example that I'm aware of was the Georgia Bureau of Investigations looked at, I think it was about 15,000 affidavit signatures after the 2020 election in Georgia, and from that they found two, two examples of potential um, signatures that shouldn't have been there that were potentially either fraudulent or forged and sent through. And so, again, a, a minute level, those are the only two data points of which I'm aware of, one of them proudly here in Maricopa County, and again, affirmed, the practice affirmed by the Superior Court of Maricopa County and by the Arizona Supreme Court. Can I? Yes, please. Can I can I ask uh, Mr. Liddy to come up for a yes, second? Yes, so we, um, we have Tom Liddy uh, with us who actually, yeah, if you want to come over here, who actually uh, led our team in the Ward v. Jackson uh, case along with all of our election litigation. So thank you, Mr. Liddy, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but there's no way I can ask that question any better than the recorder just did. No, but but Tom, um, I li you know, we live this, but uh, specifically, you know, you were giving us updates almost by the hour where this was happening in the courtroom um, because, you know, we're residents and we don't, we don't, you know, we're, we're busy with our lives. Um, we get to be a little bit more focused because we have these political jobs that, that these are our jobs to look into it. Um, but, but the residents do not, but you were, you were in that courtroom. And then uh, we saw just, um, these anomalies and stuff by a certain doctor out of Boston, um, supposedly, uh, looking at the very same things, even though that there was somebody's name was on that lawsuit challenging the standards and practices of, of Maricopa County, and she should have known better. She was in that. She saw these signatures being looked at in a random sampling of over a 1,000, of the 24,000. 1,629. That's a... Incredibly high, significant, you know, statistical sample and that we're used to in business to see what happened. showed a 99.45 percent accuracy rate mm -hmm. in the board of checks. Were were there actual were there actual experts that know what they were looking at uh, provided to the court to take a look at this, Mr. Chairman and Supervisor Hickman? The experts, the best in the United States are sitting right here at this table before you. Mm -hmm. These are the best there are at voter signature verification. However, in that Ward v. Jackson, there were two experts that came in, um, one of whom, whom said that he was astonished at the quality of work done in Maricopa County. He said no one in the country could be compared with the accuracy of Maricopa County, said with the possible exception of one county in Colorado that did a very good job as well. But both experts, one from the plaintiff, one for the defendant, both praised the signature verification system of Maricopa County. How did that expert on the, how was that expert picked uh, from both sides? I mean, who, who did they represent? Uh, per se. What they were looking for was experts in signature verification. And there is a, uh, a discipline out there in the world for signature verification that by and large has to do with banking and um, uh, looking for fraudulent documents. And so there's expertise in that regard. So they were very familiar with looking at um, handwritten signatures and comparing them. What they were less familiar with was, was the robust uh, formula or mechanisms, if you would, that that various counties across the county across the country use in order to verify whether a voter's affidavit signature is correct or not. Very different to take a signature on a check and check it on another signature on a driver's license and say, hey, is this fraud or is this not fraud? Versus checking a signature on a voter affidavit 
and saying, hey, this is somebody who's on the voting rolls, rolls on a certain jur jurisdiction, and it, is this person actually intending to vote? And there's a much more robust system, which I think you've heard about uh, today, and the judge in Ward v. Jackson heard uh, about in great detail, a system which is multi-layered. I think there were seven different layers of contacts. We heard about the cards that go out long before the election. Say, hey, is uh, the election's coming up? And uh, are you uh, you're, are you still on the voting list? Do you still live here? It starts there. And then when the affidavit envelope comes in, you know the green affidavit envelope, and they remind everybody, make sure you sign it. If you don't sign it, your vote's not going to be counted, in Maricopa County. Well, if it comes in and if it's not signed, or if it comes in and the signature doesn't match, this incredible team that is built by these gentlemen uh, right here, and which is trained by them, they go through different layers to, to make a determination, including uh, phone calling people, mailing them, giving them an opportunity to come and make another signature. Also, as I said, in the banks, they'll just look at the two signatures. Not so here. There are many different signatures that are available to look at, including driver's license, earlier voting, and they'll check all of those signatures. Anybody who lives in this world professionally knows that people's signatures uh, change over time. My signature changed because in college I got in a fight and broke my hand, right? So mine changed. Other people, they get old, as you get older, it changes. People, they get uh, you know, palsy or what have you. It, it happens. And experts know that. And so they look over time and, and this team does it better than anybody else. Yeah. And, and that was the finding of the court. Finding of the court. Um, and that's my I was gritting my teeth to the bone during the Senate hearing when I was hearing this doctor. It's like, that's been through court. Yeah. That's been in a court of law. That's been looked at by experts that put their hand on a Bible talking about this. And, and we just don't seem to be able to get that message to everyone. And I, you know, I don't know if people, some people don't want to hear any of this. But there's, I think, 80% of the people that have no idea some of the things that, that has gone through in the court setting uh, with this. So I didn't mean to belabor the point, no. but that's an important case. Thank you. Yeah, no, Supervisor Hickman, we, we agree and we will continue to improve and we will continue to uh, implement that practice. Um, but now we're going to turn to the very important topic of how do independents participate in the August primary? So Ray, you want to go ahead? Yeah. But before that, I just want to, in the light of continued improvement, there is one thing that's pointed out on the slide, the text to cure. This is a new feature that on top of the voter being able to call us back is now can actually, there's a, a application that they can text us. When we send them a letter that says your signature's in question, you can either do this, this, and this is now an option. And, and again, I invite for further discussion, looking at our plan online, you can see how that methodology works. But it is another option we're offering. As well as we'll question Tom about his bar fight later on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to leave that one for now. Yeah. Um, Go 4B. But to segue a little bit off what Tom said, that a lot of folks that voter needs to know, one of the things is that, first and foremost, that you have to be a registered voter. We have to have vetted you. We have to have done something to validate you are who you are and you are or where you say you are. So we use the USPS uh, NCOA, National Change of Address Database. We do all of that. So when we're sending this ballot, it's a little different than a, a and, and pardon me going a little bit off track here, but it's a little bit different than having to check, sign, and say, will you cast this? We're sending you a packet that we have vetted your address. We are actually tracking that packet to your house. A lot of voters aren't aware of that, but that's a good thing. That's why we can send you a status that has been mailed, and we show that it's been delivered to you. To that extent, we're using that, again, the Amazon of elections. We know you've received it. So we know that house was valid. We know you're valid. So there's a lot of chain or steps within this process that when we get that back, we know it went to the voter. We're anticipating that this is the voter. And when we do that signature verification, what a lot of voters don't know or the public doesn't know is we have multitudes of exemplars of your signature. So when you look at some of these other individuals that said, oh, I looked at this deed from 1906, I said, that's wonderful. Well, we looked at the signature ver registration form from 2021, 2022. We have, every time you've moved, when your teacher said there's a permanent record, I didn't believe it until there is an election, though. So this goes on your permanent record. Anytime you move, you're making that address change. You're submitting a new form. We're getting a new signature. Anytime you check into a polling place, you may not be an early ballot, but you did a one-time request. I've never voted before early. Ha, how do you have my signatures? Well, you registered to vote. 
And if you checked into a polling place and signed a signature roster, we use that signature as well. If you've ever at any time done a PIVO or ABLE card, when that time we have that signature. So all of these exemplars are allowed for in law, pointed out in statute, and we utilize those. So we have we know that it where it went, when it came back, we validate that that signature. So it is a process by which, but we do have a good, robust in the next step to that is speaking to the 90 day cards. 90 day cards is another methodology by which we're not, we're, it sounds like we're being altruistic and we're sending you this notice to uh, that your a ballot's gonna be sent, and we are, but there's a purpose for that. It's to validate your address as well. That 90 day, 90 day card is sent, required, return service requested. That means the post office says, if they're not there, please let us know. And we've gone one step further. We utilize what we call, or the post office calls ACS, address chain service, that is an instant notification within 24 to 48 hours of that mailing that says, Ray Valenzuela has moved. He, and he's told the post office he's moved. And so that 90 day card serves that purpose that we automatically put you into a verification process as required by law. So we can send you another notice to say, hey, the post office says you're not in Phoenix, you're in Glendale. But I just wanted to point that out since this is a public forum that there is checks and balances and this 90 day card that's going out has a purpose, a useful purpose ahead of that, which is to validate the, these able voters addresses. So, but with that, the other, purpose is to get those voters that are independent, nonpartisan, unaffiliated, because they will not be able to be sent a ballot. We want, we send them a card and on that card, it very specifically says, you know, you're an independent voter, here is your options. Return this post as paid card and select your party ballot that you wish to receive, Dem, Rep, or City Town only, as Mr. Jarrett explained, or go to request.maricopa.vote. I'm speaking pretty fast, but I wanted to say that really slow because we rather you do that than put us in the mail, wait three to four days for us to get it. So that card will give you that option. Again, better, better customer service, postage paid, but it'll also have a big print. If you want to make that request and make it instant and get acknowledgement, request maricopa.vote. That page is gonna be live today. The B ballot ready page is already, and you can, those independents ahead of the card mailing, those cards are, those, uh, Nonpartisan 90-day cars for able voters are going out today. They're dropping as we speak. So the, that volume of voters will get that card, but if they're listening now, get it and frame it because you can get your request in by today and not have to worry about returning that posted pay card. Just wanted, but that's the purpose of that 90-day card. Uh, then again, the making early ballots easier. We have the ability on our website today, uh, we are in the process of making sure everything is functional. You'll be able to do a one-time request. So let's say you're not a wanna permanently receive a mail ballot. You can go in there and make a one-time request, will not harm your record, and there will be an option there to say a permanent ABLE request, sign up for that, so the voter can go either or, and that will schedule them a ballot. But the key thing is that one-time request is an option. Again, always serving our customer. You may not be an election day or you are an election day in person, that's what you prefer, but this election for the primary, you're gonna be out of town, you're a snowbird, then have that ballot sent to Munns Park or have that ballot sent to you to your home. So that one-time request process is available. And, and that's an important point that I wanna belabor a little bit, um, is that if you, if you enroll in mail forwarding through the United States Post Office, that does not apply to your election ballot. Okay, so you so if you say forward all my mail to the summer to, to Minnesota, the election ballot will not be automatically forwarded. If you want us to send your ballot to a different place than your ordinary residence, then you must make a special request. So we can send it to Minnesota, but you must make that request to us rather than to the post office. Chairman, members of the board, th thank you, recorder, for pointing that out because that's another misnomer that we need to make folks, and we do have a lot of snowbirds that says, oh, no problem, I have my mail forwarded. That return service requested is actually saying, do not forward. Why? Because we don't know that they moved permanently to Munns Park or to California, so we don't want them to be able to participate as part of the state statute. So it's if you have a forwarding that will not get your purposely your ballot forwarded, it'll be returned to us. So. For those folks that are that do have a temporary, whether you're even in university or your your mission or your whatever it may be, let us reach out to us again. Request .vote, and you can actually make you'll put some personal information to identify you, bring up your record, uh, driver's license, all these things. It makes it secure. Then you can add that temporary address along with adding the party ballot if you're an independent. Multiple features for all of our voters, even those that are 
not that are party affiliated, but they need to add that temporary address. So just point that out. Great. So, and I think the next two slides largely go over things that we've talked about. Yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted no, to we, cover? No, we won't focus too much on this. It's there because it's, it's one of those things that it is kind of a myth buster where it talks about only registered voters can request a ballot. We spoke to that. It's not a, you know, well, people are just coming picking up ballots. No, we're vetting. These voters are vetted, tested, along with their address. Uh, verification starts with the 90 day, as we mentioned. That's an address verification. We track the ballot. We 100%, one of the things that probably focus on, and we already did, but I don't mind saying it again, 100% of the signatures off those early ballots are verified by humans. They are, they are, they go through multi-tier verification process, and 100% of those humans disposition those. Those are our staff, whether it's a user level, moving to a manager's level, using to the audit level. There's multiple levels. Uh, but I want to just re-emphasize that 100% signature verified, all ballots are verified, and they're done 100% by human. So if, uh, someone sa so if someone said that it was done by AI, that would be incorrect? That would be absolutely incorrect. Correct. Okay. And, and again, we can get into the semantics of some things where we look to pocket no pixel, no signatures, and, there, and that truthfully is, without getting too much detail, but we do look to try to find in that scan pass something that's unsigned, because again, we have to contact that voter. And if it's E minus one, and I can't get to you, or E minus, you know, we're looking at that, you dropped it off. So we do try to filter those out, but that's not AI. That is not an application that's saying, right. signature is verified, go to count. Right. All actual signatures are reviewed by actual humans. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> You're welcome. So and we do have an individual named Anthony Inez who uses initials AI, but we, we stopped <laughs> that, that him must have been that. who they were talking exactly. about. Exactly. We stopped having him sign on things because of this. Um, then it talks about the curing process, but um, do you have anything else? No. So we can move. So I, I, before we move on from the early voting section, there's just the things that I want you to take away and please share with the community to the greatest extent you can. Um, one, please go to beballotready.vote and check your voter registration information as we head into this election size season. Two, if you are an independent voter, even if you are on the active early voting list, we will not automatically send you a ballot for the primary unless you affirmatively choose a party or a nonpartisan ballot. So you can do that, again, as Ray mentioned, by website, or you can do that through the 90-day postcard. Please do that. And then three, we encourage you to be an active participant in the early voting process by signing up for text message notifications or by going to beballotready.vote and tracking your ballot all the way through the process. Because again, this is something that Maricopa County should be proud of, that it's implemented and really lets you see all stages of your ballot. Thank you, Recorder, and I just wanted to point out that currently 69% of independent voters are signed up for the active early voting list. So uh, total voters, 77%, so they do sign up at a slightly slower or a smaller percentage, but that's still a lot of independent voters, and they are, or they do represent the largest voting block in Maricopa County. So now we're moving on to the, so the next two distinct voting models. So the first one was voting by mail. The next one is that voters can choose to drop off that early ballot at any one of our voting locations. So in America, or one of our secure drop boxes. So in Maricopa County, we will be implementing and using a vote center model. So that means voters will not be assigned to an individual precinct during early voting, emergency voting, or on election day. They'll be able to choose from any one of our voting locations. We're gonna be opening anywhere from 210 to 225 voting locations on election day. We will use a phased in opening schedule. So that means that we'll have 10 voting locations open about 27 days before the election. Then at about approximately 12 days before the election, we'll open up another 45 to 55 voting locations. So then when we get to two days before the election, so this is that Monday before election day, we'll open up another 60 to 70 voting locations. And then on election day, we'll open up that last phase. That'll be another 90 to 100 voting locations for that total amount of 210 to 225 voting locations. There will be 10 to 15 secure 
ballot drop boxes in addition to those voting locations. Most of those are or will be located in city or town clerk's offices that they're, the size of the room or the size of the office doesn't allow us to or have a voting location at that or a vote center. So they'll offer that secure ballot drop box, very similar to the city of Litchfield Park for their voting location um, for this May jurisdictional election. So when we go about trying to identify where these voting locations will be, we make sure that we're providing these locations along public transportation. So that includes bus routes, light rail routes. We also make sure that these voting locations are located throughout the entire county, not just in our more densely populated areas. So if we're uh, providing a voting location in Aguila, uh, in our Gaka village, that for us, we have to drive through all the way through Pinal County, Casa Grande to arrive there and set up that voting location. We have voting locations in Gila Bend. We ensure that all of our rural communities are served by a voting location. But then we also make sure that we have a sufficient number in our more densely populated. And one of the ways that we go about ensuring that we have enough is we use a heat map analysis. And that's what this map is showing here, this blue color, red color, orange colors. And here, the the darker the reddish orange color means the higher number of in where those voters live, those in-person voters live, and they participated on election day. So we make sure that we have enough locations in those very densely populated areas to serve those voters. And we use that, those forecast models that I described earlier in this presentation then make sure that we have a sufficient number of locations that our wait times will be reasonable. So using our voter turnout forecasts, our simulations, we're able to take the number of contests on the ballot, the number of voter check-in stations, the number of voting booths in our voting locations, and then determine what that average number of voters that may visit that voting location will also then take how long does it take to check in that voter. And we're able to come with a very accurate reading of what that wait time may be at those voting locations. Um, and for the upcoming August and primary, we're forecasting very minimal wait times on average, less than one minute um, most of the day, um, maybe some of the longer locations upwards of six to seven minutes. When we get to the November general election, those times will maybe be in the, the low 10 minutes. Um, some of the longer times may be up to half an hour. Now that's if we place our locations in the right precise area. And one of the ways we do that is through this heat map analysis. Chairman? Yes, Supervisor Sellers. Yeah, can, can, would you expand a little bit on the vote center concept and, and how that improves the whole process so, so significantly? And the fact that because of the technology we have today that it is still an extremely secure but efficient process? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Sellers, so one of the ways that we're able to offer a vote center model, and I mentioned this earlier in the, the presentation, is for an August primary, we'll have upwards of 15,000 different ballot styles. In a November general election, that could be upwards of 10,000 different ballot styles. So in order to be able to offer a vote anywhere vote model, we need technology to assist us with that. That is our site book check-in stations, as well as our ballot on-demand printers. So that means that when a voter shows up, we're able to prevent print that voter's specific ballot, the one that is assigned to them that's assigned at the precinct level. That ballot also, since we're assigning it at the precinct level, allows us to meet those statutory um, requirements of reporting on the canvas at the precinct level. But just because we're using a vote center model does not mean that it's an in, or a insecure process. We're able to do audits on the, well, first off, make sure that you've not already voted, right? So. During early voting, uh, we have a intelligent barcode tracker that's assigned to every single early ballot envelope. So if a voter had received that early ballot, we are able to determine whether that early ballot's been returned to us or not. If it has been returned to us, then that voter will be offered the opportunity to vote, but it will be, uh, be offered an opportunity to vote provisionally. If they've not returned it, we can issue that live ballot at that point in time. We can then go back and then 
perform an audit post-election that audits the number of check-ins at those voting locations based on the number of ballots that were then tabulated at any one of those vo voting locations. We also have a very secure way to then transmit those ballots back from that voting location to the election department. All of our tabulators have port blockers on them. They're all sealed. We use a canvas bag that we insert those ballots into that canvas bag. Those go through a tamper evidence. They have tamper evidence seals on those as well. All of that information is logged on chain of custody documents, audit logs, and then returned back to the elections department. So more pedestrianly, and why I so wholeheartedly agree with the board's decision to move to a vote center model versus a precinct-based model is that for a precinct-based poll, you can only vote at one location, the location for the precinct for which you are assigned. In a vote center model, you can vote at any voting location in Maricopa County. The response from what you all did in 2020 has been overwhelmingly positive. We received many feedback comments saying that they like the vote center model because they can vote at a location that's nearby their home, nearby their work, nearby their gym, nearby their ch child's school. It also has the benefit of reducing voter confusion. We know where the precincts are, but your average person doesn't know where the precincts are. And that has led to the dramatic decline in that bugaboo in the elections world of provisional ballots. Because the vast majority of provisional ballots came in Maricopa County historically from people trying to vote out of precinct. Vote center models also has the benefit of additional security and reducing lines. Imagine, if you will, that somebody did something really stupid in the 2022 election and tried to disrupt one of our voting centers. If we were in a precinct-based model, people who were assigned to that precinct, you'd be out of luck until the idiot stopped doing whatever he was trying to do. In this model, you can drive two miles away and you can go to another voting location. Again, lines, lines were referenced in the 2016 context and are something that used to be sort of the, the main obstacle for elections before everything changed. But the voting center model also allows us to reduce lines because we can go to locations.maricopa.vote and you can see the line at this place is 20 minutes long, but the line two miles away is only five minutes long. I'm going to go there. So really, I applaud your decision. I think it is the sensible decision, and I think it's a decision that we should stick with as long as we have the technology, and we do have the technology. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that explanation because I think it's important for people to understand that. Hey, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Supervisor Gallardo. Real, real quickly, uh, I know we're, we're, we have a lot in front of us, but just real quickly, because I think uh, Supervisor Sellers brings up a good point, and, and Chan Recorder hit it right on the head. He talks about moving mountains, and this is exactly what Vote Centers does. It makes it more convenient for voters to be able to participate and vote at a particular location, let it be by their, by, by their place of employment, their home, or wherever they should be at on Election Day. Um, but I, I, I think you hit it really good. It, it eliminates or reduces the number of ballots, provisional ballots. I would call them ballots to be verified, but provisional ballots. And there's a, and it's, it's, it's important to know that there's a, there's a statute that the Arizona legislature put in that says that if you vote outside your precinct, you vote a ballot that's not uh, the one you should be voting, that vote, that ballot is disqualified. And so... I don't know if Ray knows off the top of his head, but I'd be curious to know, and if not, we can get it out and put it up public, you know, how many provisional ballots have been reduced because of the vote center model? How many ballots are actually being counted instead of discarded because a voter accidentally may have went on the wrong side of the street or went to the wrong church or whatever? But that's, those are it's so important to point out the reason for the vote center model. And the vote center model, it's nationally. <laughs> it's a national model that most states are going to. But more importantly, it reduces the number of provisional ballots and it allows uh, voters to have their ballot counted. And it's the most fundamental right and to be able to make sure that voters are able to vote the right ballot and be able to have it counted. 
Chairman Gates, Supervisor Gallardo. I had to look over at our expert, that Megan Goverson back there, but I think she's indicating by hand sign it's three, about approximately 3,000 in 2020. So that would, that would have been disqualified, so 3,000. But even, even more, you keep jumping on these provision ballots. We used to have 55,000. I know that number for early ballots that used to be, have to be cast because they had got an early ballot but not returned it. We just didn't know that until the implementation of technology at Sitebook. But three, approximately 3,000 that would have gone rogue or not counted. And Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Gardo, one of the other benefits is it takes time to then process those provisional ballots. Could take upwards to, of five days post the election. So every provis provisional ballot that's avoided, we're able to then report those results earlier, maybe even then on election night if they're tabulated at the precinct rather than waiting for those results. So as Mr. Valenzuela was saying, 55,000 of those early ballots that we would have had to go through and check, we're able to report that much sooner and quicker. And the 2022 election cycle will be the first election cycle in Arizona in which all 15 counties utilize vote centers in some capacity. Hmm. Supervisor Galvin. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Jarrett, how many voting centers did the county use in 2018 and how many is it planning on using this year? So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, so in 2020, we had 99 uh, vote centers for the August primary, and then 175 for the November general election. So we will, for this year, it will be 210 to 225 for both elections. So a significant increase over where we were in 2020. Thank you. But you said 2018. Were you trying to compare the last governor election? I thought there were. Weren't there voting centers in 2018? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, so we had 40 votes on election day, 40 vote centers um, in 2018. That was the first time on election day we had a vote anywhere okay. vote center. Now we also had then precinct-based voting, mm -hmm. so right, yeah. during 2018. So then there, so a significant difference from four years ago. That's thank you. That's correct. And then I did want to highlight. Uh, the recorder mentioned that a voter could drive two miles away to their closest voting location. So on average, and this includes our rural voting locations, a straight line distance, voters are, most vote centers are 1.3 miles away from the next closest voting location. Voters on average from their, their home are about 1.8 miles um, driving distance from a vote center. Vice Chair Hickman. And Tom, I'm glad you brought that up because of the, uh what we've learned in past elections and what we've been able to institute in technology and what, and what we've been able to almost experiment with. You remember the hybrid thing of going from precinct but then installing some vote centers was, was a difficult decision because of things that were going on that people didn't understand. Oh yeah, then, then 2020, the COVID and the pandemic and uh, finding places, you know, that that could uh, house people to stay away from people. I mean, all, all of these things, you get lost in the history of these decisions because it seems so long ago. But I remember, you know, uh, talking about 2018. Is this going to work? You know, is this? Are these vote centers going to work? And how are they being looked at with people that are so used to the precinct model and there's the trust? But look at what has transpired all the, all the way through on instituting new technology, new equipment, um, and better, uh, better ways of doing business. Yeah, Supervisor Hickman, it's going to work and it's going to be more intuitive for voters. It is more intuitive that you can show up to any voting location. And before we turn the page, look at that map. Because if you guys approve these voting locations, I want people to understand that these were data-driven decisions. Decisions based off of where historically people have turned out, not based off of who called Clint, not, you know, for any other reason, but these were based off of data from historic elections meant to serve our county. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Mr. Jarrett, we're going to zip through the end here, right? <laughs> That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank so you. It's not only the number of voting locations, it's how can we ensure that those voting locations are set up, are then supported through that entire early voting period. This slide shows our command center, our command center staffed by, with subject matter experts within elections, those from each of our key divisions. It also, we 
and have the ACTIC and the Sheriff's Office within our command center. It really serves as a fusion center that we can be responsive to situations that occur at the voting location. It also helps us know when, if those site books that are used to check in voters, if they're locked at the end of the day during early voting. It, we can see whether our poll workers are actually checked in and ready to serve voters. We can tell whether those ballot on demand printers are set up and they've done the test prints during the setup. This provides us a lot of information about an insight into what's going on into those voting locations. But there's another key feature that these site books in this command center allows us to do, and the recorder mentioned it. It's that it allows our poll workers to report back wait times. So they use our site book check-in station to report how many voters are in line at any point in time, every 15 minutes. And then this information then is reported back to our website that we can then inform voters. It's locations.maricopa.vote. So voters will also be able to go to this site. They'll be able to get a list of every vote center that we'll have open. They'll also be able to enter in their address and find their closest voting location. They'll be able to sort that list by the number of voters in line or the, um, the wait time that's in each of these voting locations. So again, we're giving the voters information for them to choose how they want to participate and that they can then, if there is a wait time on election day, that they can avoid that wait time and drive maybe just one mile further or the same distance, just in the all opposite direction to go to one of those voting locations. For, so a very good, useful tool that we're offering to voters. Mr. Jared, is locations.maricopa.vote mobile friendly? Mr. Chairman, yes, it is. You can use your smartphone um, to um, look up that information. And if you don't have a smartphone and you don't have access to the website, then you can then call our STAR call center. They have access to this information. And that number is 602-506-1511. Thank you. So we've talked a lot about the scale of Maricopa County and how large it is. And when you talk about how many voters we have, 2.6 million, we're larger than seven states, it's easy to forget that we're really just one community. And that's especially true when we're talking about elections, right? We're hiring 3,300 temporary workers to support these elections. When you break that down on a numbers basis, that's about one person out of every 450 households. There's more household, or 450 households in a square mile block. That's about half of the households on average in those square miles. So if you think about who is supporting the elections department, it is your neighbors. It's your family members, it's your friends. And on this slide, we have a few pictures of some of our actual poll workers that work in Maricopa County. These are some of our premium poll workers. And if you spend any time talking to these poll workers, they will go through and talk about some of the issues that we've described today. They remember before we had these check-in stations, those, those sign-in rosters where we had a very manual process that a voter two lines and you had to go in and sign that, that roster. Standing, voters standing in line till after midnight, waiting to check in and vote in Maricopa County. They remember having to turn away a voter that was out of precinct. Maybe it was because we just went through a redistricting effort and their congressional district line changed and it forced them to have to go to a different precinct than the one they've always voted at in the past. And then that poll worker having to pull out a manual map to find out where that next precinct is, and then only to then send that voter to another precinct, and then finding out that that poll worker read the map wrong. And now that voter's gone to have to go to a third precinct, all an attempt to, to vote. They remember these stories, and they tell those stories, and then they also remember 2020, when our voting operations went incredibly smooth. So they are some of the biggest fans of the vote center model. Now, I mentioned we need 3,300 temporary workers to work for us in these upcoming elections. That breaks down to just over 2,600 poll workers, um, about 750 central board workers or truck drivers or warehouse techs, signature, verifi signature verification techs, all of those staff members that will come and support the elections. 
and we have some challenges, right? We've gone through some, a very um, period worth a lot of inflation, and that's driving up salary costs. So in January uh, 2022, I went before the board and I presented a budget for our ELE1. That's the funding source that will support um, the upcoming 2022 elections. And in that, I identified um, some potential contingencies, about $500,000 per election, $1 million in total. And in this plan, I've actually implemented or we're requesting a revision in some of the salaries that we had requested to the board back in January. And it's because of some of these inflationary pressures. And we have some data to support this. So for us to be able to recruit those 3,300 temporary staff members, we need some additional recruiters. So we had a job posting open for uh, just over five weeks, um, eight recruiter positions. It yielded only one viable candidate, and we were paying $15 an hour for that. So now we've gone out and assessed the market. It's more appropriate for us to raise that up to um, $18 an hour. So in our plans, we do have a budget section, that's section 10 of the, of the plan that calls out what these costs will be, and it actually includes a line item for that inflationary adjustment. The board also did um, approve a premium pay for our poll workers who were able to increase all of their pay by one extra dollars. So this will help us recruit in addition to our Get Involved at Maricopa Vote website. We have a brand new dashboard that Anyone from the community can go visit. It has a list of every single job that we are recruiting for, a little job description, what are the, the traits and the, the key job responsibilities for those positions, and then a way, a portal for them to sign up and send their information for us, and we can use that and then reach back out to find what is that best work situation for them. Is it at a boat center that's close to their home? Are they willing to commute downtown and work at McTech, our elections department, for an extended period of time to work in our signature verification process, early ballot processing boards? So a very robust way of information for voters to get and find out how to be informed of how they can help serve democracy and their community. So let's just pause there for one second. 3,300 workers are going to be part of the 2022 election cycle in Maricopa County. That means when you're talking about election unicorns, you're not talking about, when you're talking about election workers, you're not talking about evil demons or magical unicorns, but you're probably talking about somebody in your neighborhood or in the next neighborhood over. So just, I hope that people keep that in mind. And then I hope that people also realize this is a great opportunity because if you have kids coming home for the summer for college, or if you have a high school senior and you're not satisfied with what they're doing for that summer, send them our way because it's a lot of people to recruit. And really we've got to get on the recruiting wagon over the next few weeks because without those 3,300 3, people, this show doesn't work. Mr. Chairman. Vice Chair Hickman. I continue to see uh, reach outs by a particular party looking for observers. And I continue to say, why don't you just work? Why don't you just work it and understand the election, the training and everything that goes into it. And, and then you get paid for it too. I mean, if that's, if that's truly what your passion is, um, you can actually work it and, and learn about how elections are done in this county. Uh, not just sitting, wondering if I can show up on a Tuesday to observe other people working. I don't get it, so. No, Supervisor Hickman, you're absolutely right. Both Ray and Scott have been amazing at working with all three of our recognized political parties in here in Maricopa County, and we would really love them, yes, to participate as observers, but first and foremost, as workers in this process who are doing this process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not we're not discouraging people from being political party observers. No, I'm not yeah. discouraging it. I mean, there's some people that just want to do that, but there's there's also quite a few people that and you get paid. Learn. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, and the the recorder is correct. We'll have a meeting in early June with all the political parties to talk through that political party observer process, um, inform them of how they can participate because they play a very vital role to the election administration process, especially even at our central count tabulation center. And that's actually the next slide. Right, nice segue. 
where our political parties are part of the transparency that we're providing at our at our central count tabulation center and within every process within our central count facility. So our political parties will, and actually in the ballot tabulation center itself is one of the unique areas that they actually play a role in going through and verifying that our tab tabulators haven't counted any ballots. So the very first time that we're tabulating ballots, that there haven't been any ballots counted so far. And then after every shift in between there, they're also performing that check. And then at the end of the day, they're looking at and helping tally those final numbers and counts. But they're also playing another critical role as they're selecting the batches of ballots that will then go to be hand counted post the election process. So. There is one piece that there's been a lot of discussion about tabulation, right? And we talked about the sheer number of ballots and the quantity of number of ballots and being 2.6 million voters, potentially up to 1.9 million ballots being tabulated on election day. And that discussion has been, should we go to a hand count process? And I would here to say that if we went to a hand count process, that 1.9 million ballots, you think about the number of contests that are on every ballot, 70 contests. That's 1.33 million uh, or 133 million different um, contests that would have to then go through a hand count process. That doesn't count the number of uh, candidates and ovals on each of those ballots. We would be counting ballots for years just to try to get that election process. Alternatively, we have a very secure, reliable, and accurate tabulation system. Why do we know it's reliable, secure, and accurate? It's because it goes through federal certification by voting system testing laboratories that are accredited with the United States Elections Assistance Commission. Um, it goes through state certification. We perform logic and accuracy tests before every uh, election and after every election. So that's one of the ways we know. We test every piece of equipment, but we also then have the Secretary of State come in, create a different test deck of ballots unknown to us and run those ballots through our tabulation equipment to verify and test that is accurate before any of that equipment is used to tabulate a single ballot. And then I mentioned the political party observer's role in selecting those ballots for the hand count. So they're the ones that select each batch that will then go and be hand counted, again, not by us, by the political party appointees to verify that what that tabulation system counted and reported matches what those appointees from the political parties, humans performing that hand count. And if there's a variance, then we have to go and select another batch of ballots to be hand counted. And let me point out that through all of 2020 and 2021, we've never had an inaccurate hand count. They've all found that our tabulation equipment is 100% accurate. Supervisor Sellers? Yeah, and, and just to reinforce, there is a paper ballot for every vote. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Sellers, that is correct. In Maricopa County, we use paper ballots. So, and even our accessible voting devices now have, and this was new for 2020, those even have now a paper ballot that can be recorded back to and and match whatever our canvas is back to the paper itself. And then there's a digital image that's created for every one of those ballots. Thank you very much. Mr. Jarrett. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Valenzuela to talk through some of our voter outreach efforts. So we are on the home stretch. There's, I'll let you know preemptively, there are two slides at the most, but these, um, some of them are just gonna speak to the, they speak to themselves. Unfortunately and fortunately, we have to battle mis, dis, and malinformation, more so than ever. Um, and But it, out, out of that grew, through continued improvement, some of this process, best practice processes. So what we've done is we've created FAQs, we created infographics, we created a website dedicated to malinformation, mis, just the facts, uh, but more so, we know that a lot of folks just want to be educated. 
So we're not just always combating that mis, dis, and malinformation. We have the BeBallotReady.Vote, which is a multifaceted portal for voters to go see their status, go see what's the name do I have on file, what's my party, my voting history. You can go in there and see the last 10 years of how you voted, early or in person. But the beauty of that portal also has tied to it beneath that a lot of these infographics, a lot of the information you'll see in this slide. Uh, some of the stuff is amazing with regards to short, purposefully short videos to capture the audience as to what is tabulation, you know, uh, the what is early voting, what is mail by voting, and then an infographic that we share with the community partners. We just had a couple of tours from for the legislature. We just had the advocacy group come last week. We did an amazing job. We have some more scheduled that we're having them come in. We want them to come in and, and our communications team and our uh, outreach team Thanks to the board's partnership and funding and such, we have created this environment where we, those folks are coming in and have takeaways, these, this toolkit that we love to call it, that says take this and it has easy to read infographics. We're giving them to our community partners, not only that, the advocacy groups, but also our jurisdictions. City of Litchfield Park, they get this info kit. They're putting it on their website without having to restate or re-educate themselves, they're saying, I take exactly this social media grab and post it. So I just want to know that that's something that stemmed out of good, the phoenix, if you will, came, uh, you know, and grew uh, from the ashes. And there were some things that did burn down, I don't care. But uh, next slide, we'll jump into informing voters. Uh, this is, again, a segue right off of the Be Ballot Ready Dot vote. Uh, we have English, Spanish. We serve those communities. Uh, we the tenga boleta lista dot voto. Uh, we have all of this is in English, Spanish on our website. The voter can go there. But some of the biggest things that we and and I can speak having been I used to say old older in this process legacy participant in this process, I'll use that, uh, that we were a little bit reactive rather than proactive uh, as far as outreach. And a lot of times people just voted. Now, they, it, the, the stirring of the pot, if you will, has caused people to question, say, well, how, what is this about? So we are doing a more proactive and have been, and this just even more so with advertising. Uh, media interviews were available. Uh, we are doing the social media, t digital, all this. I think a commercial is going to just uh, launch in a couple days or weeks, if not, which is towards that angle that the elections is us, meaning the community. So, one of the Mr. Valenzuela, sorry to interrupt. I think the question everyone wants to know, we see Phil the ballot here, is, is Phil back or there were rumors, you know, he was, he was, had some other offers. <laughs> Can you speak to that? Uh, I'll let the recorder speak to it, but <laughs> Phil is present. He's just not as uh, popular. I think he, he uh, but we, he's he is pre he, uh, he's he's present. There. He's still there. He's part of it. He's not going to be prominent in some of our advertisement. It's going to be trying us to focus on the community. It's but. less hero ball and more team ball now, <laughs> all right? Uh, less Michael Jordan and more 2022 Phoenix Suns, where there's a whole team. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. But to close it out, uh, again, we have our relaunch Get Involved page, which we're really proud of. And again, I, I made a nod to Megan Gilbertson, uh, who is our communications director. They, they revamped that to a point of where it is so user-friendly. If you go there and you're interested in, and I usually say Christmas money, you know, you want to work in November, you can work one day, six days, the 12-day site, 27 days, or up to a couple months. So that's another way for voters to be informed, not just by reading, but by doing. So we're hoping they'll take advantage of. But the one thing is, is that I'm really proud of, and I, again, is our we've relaunched our what used to be a step up program. It's a student election clerk program. So to kind of segue off of the recorder saying, if you're mad at your senior high school student, or, you don't have to be mad at them. They actually, if they want to earn money, 16 to 18 year olds can now actually serve as election clerks. They had in the past, but kind of COVID related restrictions. We restarted that, revamped it. So we want to promote those young folks to get civically engaged, learn about the process, and hopefully become a lifetime voter off of that, but also earn some money. So that is a good program that if any of you are interested in your communities of outreach you're doing to some of those, that it is restarted and it is a great, great opportunity where they get to get out of school on Tuesday <laughs> and they don't lose credit, and they don't get dinged for an absentee. So, you know, thinking in that mindset, and they get a, a couple of bucks. So, and I, the mindset is more. Whenever the elections communications team comes to me, I say, the new idea, I say, great, 
Let's do that and more. And so, yes, Betty, Megan, Eileen, all of them have been working hard over the past two months to start communicating about our 2022 elections plan, but we want to do more. And if there's communities, if there's organizations, if there's groups that you want us speaking to, if there's pockets that we're missing, have community members tell you and tell us, or just tell us, because we have experts, we have information, but we've got to get that information to more people because, as Ray said, this is now not a reactive game, but a proactive game, and we want to get into as many places as we possibly can. And Chairman, to close it up before members of the board, the other thing is we do, we do have the just the facts vote the newsletter that we do a monthly to all of the board workers, but to anybody that wants to subscribe that'll provide some of these tidbits and a, in a palatable amount to be able to say, we'll, we'll talk just about ballot by mail, we'll talk just about. So that newsletter is out there for subscription. Um, I'm touting it because there is a, a newly added thing, it's called Elections Connections, where, where, where De De Core Director Jared and myself answer questions. So we already had one Q&A session and I was able to to feed the questions and, and push towards Mr. Jarrett here, and next one is he gets to, to, to me. So be, feel free to go out there and ask questions and say, you know, why do you like working with Scott Jarrett? You know, any kind of questions you would love to ask, feel free to ask on that newsletter. But that closes it out for and opens up to our questions. I think. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we'd be happy to answer any questions maybe that we didn't answer prior through this presentation. Wonderful, that's a fantastic uh, presentation. I hope we had a bunch of people, I, I was waiting for Vice Chair Hickman to ask how many people were on the line, because I hope there were a bunch. Uh, great information, questions I from my colleagues. I think you just asked that question, so if we can get. <laughs> uh, and I asked that question just yeah. because how important the um, that December night was with the canvas uh, and certifying the vote and finding out nobody was really looking at it, especially didn't afterwards. And uh, that's why I've been asking through the year, like how many people truly care that they're watching this plan get set up? And and maybe generate their own questions. We, we get a chance because you're right here in front of us, but. Um, Chairman Supervisor Hickman, I checked earlier, we had approximately 50 viewing this meeting. Okay, how many how many people live in this county? Four, about 4.5 million. And how many people have had questions about the last election and the, and the setup? It just, it, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it boggles my mind. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, are you opening up for questions? Cause yeah, I, I am. I would just encourage everyone, you know, that's this will remain on YouTube. So people have, all the people that are gonna be asking questions in August or November, go on there now. They have questions, they can raise them with this group. And uh, I, I, I don't wanna, you know, people to say they don't understand what's going on if they haven't taken, if they haven't availed themselves of the resources that are available. Mr. Jarrett. Mr. Chairman, you're correct to point out that this will be on YouTube, but there will be many other events forthcoming, um, whether there'll be online forums as well as in-person forums where we will offer um, opportunities for voters to in, be, uh, learn more about the 2022 election cycle. Thank you. Uh, so questions from my colleagues. Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gallardo. I don't have a, a question, but just a, a comment. Um, I've always said, and I will continue to stand by this, uh, these comments and these principles, is that we have the best election team in the world right here in Maricopa County. Um, we have experts that have been doing it for so long that have, um, have given every moment of their life in, in, in putting together a solid election. And I've always, uh, as, even as a former employee, I, I, know, I know what they go through. I know how many hours they go through uh, trying to put together an election. Um, I know how important it is for us to, to have a plan. And every election, I always try to stop and think, okay, what can possibly go wrong? You know, you always have that in the back of your mind. You know, have you covered all the, the, the different pieces? And, um, and I feel very comfortable with the plan we have in place for 2022. I believe 2022 will be the best election uh, ever. 
in Maricopa County once again. I mean, it, it, we continue to just outdo ourselves in terms, of, I, I like the comment that our recorder uh, stated earlier, he moves mountain, we're moving mountains to allow voters the opportunity to exercise the most fundamental right they have. We're doing everything we can to make sure our elections are secure and transparent. We have a standardized process in front of us to move forward for our primary and general election. Um, I look at this plan as I have looked at previous plans. Our elections are safe, secure, they're accurate. We have professionals, experts that are running the show. We have uh, 3,000 or so folks that are going to come in and help. These are folks from all over the county that are going to come in and help and, and make sure our elections um, are conducted uh, to a standard in which voters are looking for. They want transparency. They want security. They want uh, they want to make sure the election's accurate, but they want to make sure that the obstacles in front of them are taken away. And that's exactly what we have in front of us today, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am pleased with the plan that has been presented. I had a nice discussion with, um, with our election folks last week to go over it. Um, I think we're ready. We're ready for the 2022 election. We're always going to have the naysayers. We're always going to have folks that are going to want to throw rocks at our process. It doesn't matter what we have in front, they'll continue to be negative. They'll continue to live in a fantasy world. They'll continue to want to cast uh, uh, conspiracies and false statements. Um, and we just have to continue to push back and tell the voters the truth and tell them exactly what our plan is for 2022. We don't hide our plan. Our plan is public. Any voter can see it. Any political party, any candidate can see it, especially the Arizona State Senate they can see our plan. Um, you're gonna have folks that are gonna wanna throw rocks and, and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, we can just continue to move forward uh, with a transparent process. Um, you'll continue to have, unfortunately, legislators that are gonna wanna make uh, false statements and live in a fantasy world. We can't do anything about that, but continue to move forward, serving the people of Maricopa County and putting together the best election in front of us. And I believe that's what we have today, Mr. Chairman. And Supervisor Gallardo, thank you for those comments. And for those who maybe haven't been following us over the past few years, you know, Supervisor Gallardo comes from uh, working in the recorder's office, working in elections. And I've seen you when you've not responded like this and you've said, this doesn't cut it, come back. This isn't good enough, and you've pushed. And so I know when you make those comments, you mean it. You've done your homework, and so thank you. And I think that speaks a lot to what the Recorder's Office and Elections Department has done. So thank you, Supervisor Gallardo. Other comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually have a few questions. Please. Um, and so obviously uh, the three of you said that you're going to continue raising awareness and spreading the word, but this is the board's opportunity to ask questions and to solicit some information here. So I don't want anyone to think looking back on this day that the board didn't you know, look under every single rock. And I say and we say that the elections are safe, secure and transparent. And I totally believe that in terms of security and transparency, but I wanna underline the word safe because I wanna make sure that voters are safe, that election workers are safe and that the ballots are safe, okay? And so, um, Mr. Jarrett, and without going into too much detail, but maybe you can give a, a succinct answer here. Is there a security plan for all of these voting centers? And what do you anticipate or what's, what sort of plans that you have to make sure that voters are safe, election workers are safe, and the ballots are safe? So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, the first piece to any security plan is providing our poll workers with the resources that they need. So we have implemented using uh, funds that were provided provided by the Board of Supervisors, a premium poll worker training, where we've gone through a, an intense, really, learning session where we've provided them de-escalation techniques and being able to respond to issues with empathy rather than sympathy. So that's the first step, avoiding any sort of challenges or conflicts within the voting location. However, if they are not able to resolve that, then we do have an escalation procedure. I mentioned our command center earlier today. So we have a, a entire team of people 
monitoring what's happening in those voting locations. We have very important relationships with law enforcement communities across the county. We're actually inviting them in. In June 17th, every single law enforcement agency will be invited into McTech, where they'll be able to meet our team. They'll be able to meet the sheriff's office that we um, contract with that will be in our act, in our command center. The ACTIC, the Arizona Counter Information Terrorism Center, will also be in mon monitoring. We will have unmarked vehicles that will from the sheriff's office that will be able to be deployed out and be able to observe and be our eyes and ears at those voting locations. So I am very confident that we will be able to provide a safe voting option for all of our voters. Okay, great. Thank you. And then the other issue we talked about, and you've touched upon them, is you know the difference between election workers and poll watchers, right? So poll watchers come from the partisan angle. So I really hope that no one either from either of the two political parties signs up as a poll watcher thinking that they're going to find some sort of chicanery going on or they're going to be a hero. In fact, I hope they're going to be impressed by how well these things are run and they walk away being like, okay, that was a great experience. I'd love to do that again or maybe I'll be an election worker next time. But there are some parts of the last election where I think we ran into trouble where people were, you know, these bad actors were trying to allege things that were not true. So let's talk about hand counting. We're talking about voting centers today, so we're not talking about precincts. So please walk over how you do the hand counting after the election where people think, oh, you have to do 2% of all precincts, but we don't have precinct voting in this instance here. So, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, yes, yeah, so state statute has allowed for the use of vote centers in all Arizona counties. And since the adoption of the use of those vote centers, that then now allows for that hand count process to be done by at the voting center instead of the precinct base. So it's a 2% selection of every vote center, which actually provides a much more randomized sample of all the ballots that would be voted at that voting location. Also, because many of our vote centers, a lot more people now are visiting those locations, it does result in more ballots being part of that hand count process. So the fact that we're using a vote center model does not diminish the integrity of the election. It actually enhances it, and it means that there's more checks and balances over that process. And again, I just want to highlight that the hand count is completed by the political parties, not Maricopa County staff members. I think Mr. Liddy had a, a comment, if that's all right, yep. Supervisor uh, Galvin. As, while he's coming up, Supervisor Galvin, I would say also that not even paid by us, really appointed by the parties, they also do the choosing of the ballots mm -hmm. that are hand counted. And so in 2020, there were 47,000 plus ballot positions that were hand counted and it matched 100%. And also, as I mentioned before, now all 15 counties have a vote center ma model, but Maricopa County was actually the 13th county to come online with vote centers. And so this wasn't new to Arizona in 2020. This wasn't even entirely new to Maricopa County in 2020. This has been done and it is allowed for in state statute. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I just wanted to clarify that the statute um, requires a minimum of a 2% count and a maximum of 5%. And so there's a discretion. You could do two, three, four, or five, and that's a decision that your professionals can make at that time, that it's not set at 2%. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go back to some phone calls I think some of us received from congressional uh, representatives, and one of them said that we should do 100%. Uh, so uh, th then they, and they told me point blank, well, it's not... You, you can do as many as you want. So you're saying 5%, 2%. And, you know, what I did was got off the phone to call our former recorder to find out truly what's in statute uh, to get back in touch with that person. So was you want to give some clarification on that? Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Rickman, I want to be as clear as I can be on this. Were you to order a 100% hand count would be breaking the law. So the law that was written by the legislature that passed the House and the Senate and was signed by the governor. It says you must tabulate the ballots with machines. Now, the reason for that is very clear. Many, many studies have shown, I can provide the citations for you, that machine counting is more accurate than hand counting because humans make mistakes. It happens all the time. But 
regardless of the, whether the legislature was correct or not, in this instance they were, it's mandatory that tabulation be machine. Now, the audit that's required is a 2% to 5% that's hand counting. And you match that against what the machine said, and it's in 2020, 100% accuracy. If there was something other than that, then there's other steps that can be taken in order to try to find if there was a problem. But as we know, in 2020, there were no problems with tabulation. It was very accurate. So the statutory audit is a 2% to 5% hand count, and that's discretionary. And after the election, your professionals will come to you and they'll make a recommendation for you on that. Is the is the vote centers a random sample? Do, do they just say like uh, we'll pull out that, or do, or do the parties determine which the vote centers are? Well, who? I found this out too. So go ahead, go go ahead, Mr. Steve. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman. So on the day after the election, so that Wednesday, um, the political party chairs from the county will come to the election center and they will randomly draw the batches to be selected. That includes the early batches as well as the vote centers. So it's done through random selection and then each county chair takes a turn selecting which one. So they don't say, I want this specific one. It's randomly determined. But I heard from somebody else uh, that's high up in the state party system that we should just go in and 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 make a couple choices in specific neighborhoods. And uh, I said, I don't think that's... Supervisor Hickman, the supervisors do not determine uh -huh. which ballots are hand counted. Ray does not determine that. Scott does not determine that. The political parties and their designees and their leadership at the county level determine that. And then the political parties and their designees perform the hand count audit. So maybe I was correct when I said, you know, I'm just going to keep referring to state law. I'm just going to keep referring back to state law, even when it was from law enforcement authorities that quite don't get that, that we operate within state law. Hey, Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, Supervisor Hickman, I want to add that the reason to have this check is to have confidence in the tabulation. And if you want to have confidence, that sample that you pick between 2% and 5% must be randomly selected. If you cherry pick, then that rapidly degrades the confidence level in the data that you receive in the far end. So if you want to have a 95% degree of confidence that your sampling is accurate for the the entire corpus of the, uh, or the entire universe of the ballots, or in 97% or 99%, ask any st statistician at ASU or U of A, NAU, they'll tell you that your sample must be randomly selected. Without that, you don't get any confidence level. They would cherry pick the, the neighborhoods in my district. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. All right. Let's be real. Supervisor Galvin. Mr. Chairman, last question. Yep. Uh, thank you for those answers. The other one I have for you is the actual counting of votes after Election Day. Obviously, we live in a very instant gratification society where people want to know what the vote tally is right at that second. Um, I believe that when the votes come in, the election workers are working very hard to get all the votes together and the ballots together. There's what I would call a pause, right, in what the vote tally is. And then some people have alleged that that's the opportunity, you know, for some dirty tricks to then change the outcome. So, Mr. Jarrett, please explain how what happens after election day is over at 7 p.m., all the things that election workers have to do in order for the county to then commence the rest of the week. Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Galvin, so state law has actually changed and allowed us to begin tabulating ballots earlier in the process. And this has been progressive. In 2018, it's seven days before the election. 2020 is two weeks. Now it's upon receipt and after the logic and accuracy test. So we will be employing enough temporary staff members as well as our permanent staff members to get as many of those early ballots tabulated and reported at that 8 p.m. dump as possible, or first reporting. We're, by statute, we're not allowed to report prior to 8 p.m. So that will include most likely every ballot that we've received and been able to get through signature verification and early ballot processing and tabulation and adjudication um, by that Sunday before the election. That means that there will be, we'll be offering uh, 100 plus voting locations on that Monday. We'll be offering um, 210 voting locations on 
or 210 to 225 on Tuesday. That means that there will be a lot of early ballots that will be dropped off very late in the cycle. So because we will be employing enough staff members <clears throat> to be able to get as many of those early ballots reported at that 8 p.m. first post um, on election night, there will be a slight lull in that Wednesday time period because it takes time to do our job according to, with integrity and based on statute, making sure that those signatures are verified, that they go through early ballot processing, that they then can go be tabulated and then through an adjudication process. So most likely there might be a little lull on that Wednesday reporting period, and then we'll be starting to report a significant number of those, what we call those late earlies, those that are dropped off late in the, in the process on Monday and on Tuesday, could be upwards of 100 to 155,000 ballots on election day that will have to go through that process. But our goal is to have 100% of ballots that did not need to go through that curing process reported by the curing deadline, that 5 p.m. deadline, hopefully even that Friday, three days after the election, 99% of those reported on that Friday evening. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, any last uh, comments? Quick question. Yep. Um, I appreciated you guys, especially when you touched on the proactive approach, because the proactive approach is trying to identify problems to the voter and trying to get in front of it, or this is how this cannot happen. We have absolutely um, something to, to fall back on or that I'd like to ask. Where's, where's our Sharpies moment in this plan? You, you guys talk to this if today we're talking to 50 people and us um, about Sharpies, because we were going to go ahead and, because as a voter, I've always understood about the bleed through and we totally, totally got the voter to understand, just use ballpoint pens. And then this new offset printing with the ballot, which happened uh, two years ago, made it available where we could do Sharpies. Uh, but our, maybe our uh, election vote centers on day of weren't quite uh, up to speed, and we started to have a problem with the Mylar film, with the wet ink, and we switched to Sharpies, and that created a big thing, a big issue, if you guys can recall, uh, day of, and that night of the next day, where we were constantly trying to reach out and say, hey, 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 Look back at six months ago when we said Sharpies were fine to use. So I guess I'm just asking on one thing on a day of, can we make sure that, or are we gonna make sure that it's just Sharpies so they can have quick dry on this Mylar film or is the equipment changed? So Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Hickman, so back in 2020, Sharpies were the recommended ballot marking device on election day and we had used them on election day, and that was the only marking device because of how quick they dry. So they wouldn't cause a smudging on the precinct-based tabulators. That's the only day that we use tabulation in, the, in any of our vote centers is on election day. So that's why it was critical for us to use Sharpies. There is no way that the use of Sharpies impacted any votes. And this was actually confirmed even in the Senate's review. Um, they had that same conclusion that there was no impact because of the offsetting of ovals. Now, since 2020, we've been able to go through and do some additional testing on some ballot marking devices. So we won't be using Sharpies in 2022. But it's not because Sharpies created an issue with the tabulation equipment in 2020. It's because they did tend to bleed through the ballot more, but that didn't impact tabulation because of the offset ovals. We've now found a new mar ballot marking that does dry, not quite as fast as Sharpies, but does not bleed through at the same rate. We've also increased the weight of the paper. We'll be going from 80 pound paper to 100 pound paper, which will also be reducing the amount of bleed through that occurs on the ballot. I'm glad I asked that question because that's news to me. Uh, so thank you for for letting me know. Yep, thank you. Anything else from my colleagues? Um, yeah, excellent presentation, and I know 
back in 2019, 2018, 2019, when we talked about the possibility of the board and the recorder's office partnering to run elections director uh, together, there were naysayers said, you can't do that, that's not gonna work, you know, can't have two different authorities. And I would say, um, I don't know if anyone else can do it, but you two gentlemen, Scott Jarrett, Ray Valenswell, you guys have done it together. It's exceptional, and I am grateful every single day that the two of you ran the 2020 election together, that this board stepped up alongside the recorder so that, frankly, we could defend your efforts and the efforts of every single election worker. And uh, to you, Mr. Richer, thank you for redoubling down, doubling down on that. Uh, election operations agreement, and uh, as the current chair and as one member of this board, uh, I consider it an honor to get to work with you uh, almost every day on these issues, and I think that it creates a great partnership for the people of Maricopa County, but as I said during my chairman's speech earlier this year, it was my intent that this be the most transparent election in our history, and after reviewing this plan, I see that it's going to be um, the number of uh, advancements and innovations that are to make sure that the voter can have it their way. Um, I, I thank you guys for that. Uh, 2020, I've said this before, was the most scrutinized election in the history of the world. I don't mean that as hyperbole. It was. We know there will be a ton of eyeballs on 2022. And I welcome that, and I think everyone in this room does as well. So um, thank you for that. And at this point, uh, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would be honored to make the motion to approve the 2022 election plan that includes the August primary and the November general. Thank you, Vice Chair Hickman. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, I would be honored to uh, second the motion to approve the 2022 election plan for this year. Great job, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Supervisor Gallardo. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just want to make a quick comment. Please. Uh, thank you all for the great work that you're doing, this great report. I just want to paraphrase a one-time Defense Secretary. There's no knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. <laughs> and uh, we definitely got the known knowns from you. Known unknowns is turnout. Um, of course, we're going to be worried about the unknown unknowns, but I'm confident you guys are up to the task. So thank you so much. Well put. Uh, any other comments or, or final questions? I'll, I'll say, as I did in, uh, in January when we got together, that the book is always better than the movie. So please read the whole report. It goes into great detail on all of these things. So anyone who's listening, anyone who's watching, please encourage people to read it. It really does have a lot of detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything further? I thought it was well spoken by the guy that's going to be on this ballot that uh, during this election. All right. So any further discussion? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and please pass on uh, how grateful we are to everybody in our elections department. All right, I would uh, entertain any further motions at this time. Motion to go into executive session, Mr. Chairman. Second. All right, all right. we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. We will now head into executive session. Thanks, everyone.